The Freedman Fraud, The Bacon Ciphers in Shakespeare. This video is dedicated to Elizabeth Wells Gallup, Frank and Parker Woodward and William Stone Booth. For the last 60 odd years, Orthodox Bacon and Shakespeare scholars supported by universities around the four corners of the globe, fanned by the international news media, have deceived the rest of the world into believing that the Freedmans, the two greatest cryptographers of the 20th century, had once and for all in their book, The Shakespearean Ciphers Examined, put an end to the notion of Baconian ciphers being present in the Shakespeare plays. It is a view which still prevails to the present day. But even though the Shakespearean ciphers examined continues its deception unabated, there were those from the very beginning, suppressed by orthodox scholars, the universities and the international media, that were able to see through this very carefully constructed fraudulent charade. Professor Pierre Henrion of Versailles University, a renowned expert in cryptography and member of the French secret cipher service in the Second World War, said of the Freedmans and their book, The Shakespearean Ciphers Examined, To anyone with real cryptological experience, it is hard to reconcile the impartiality claimed by the authors with the skill and ledger domain by which certain danger points have been avoided. It is these unexpected manipulations which have led me at times to suspect a command performance in what is admittedly a very clever plant. The book, granted, does away with the fanciful work of some amateur cryptologists, an easy task, an empty triumph. But, having thus gained the confidence of the readers, the authors deceive them by scientific demonstrations which they know to be false. In his full-length work on the Freedmans, Kenneth R. Patton forthrightly described their book as one of the most fraudulent publications in the history of literature. The Freedmans, who unquestionably, unquestionably knew exactly what they were doing, stooped to the very lowest kind of intellectual dishonesty. In truth, this book is probably the most astonishing collection of deceit and deliberately calculated falsifications that have ever been crammed between the covers of a book. I can only believe that some person or organisation with a vested interest in the perpetuation of the Stratfordian myth commissioned the Freedmans to write it. Top-ranking member of the Secret Intelligence Service, MI6, Frank W. Winterbotham, worked very closely with Friedman at Bletchley Park and was the man responsible for the organisation, distribution and security of the decrypted ultra-intelligence. He privately informed members of the Francis Bacon Society that Friedman had secretly confessed to him that it was wrong and untrue to dismiss all Baconian ciphers. We understand from Group Captain F. Winterbotham, author of Ultra Secret, that Friedman admitted to him that he had been wrong to condemn all Baconian ciphers. Ultra Intelligence, meaning most secret, was given the code name Boniface, which incorporates an anagram of F. Bacon. As a cover, British intelligence created a fictional MI6 master spy named Boniface, who controlled and directed a fictional series of agents throughout Europe. The code name Boniface adds up to 53 in simple cipher. The number 53 is an occult Baconian Rosicrucian number representing the letters SOW in simple cipher, standing for Sons of Wisdom or members of Bacon's Rosicrucian Freemasonry Brotherhood and evidently high ranking members of British intelligence MI5 and MI6. Yet even those and others who knew that the Freedmans had perpetuated arguably the greatest secular fraud in all literary history, they had little or no knowledge of the full story which lay behind it. It is a story which begins from the time the Freedmans worked with Elizabeth Wells Gallup at Riverbank and reveals the hidden truth behind several anonymous Riverbank publications on the Bacon Biliteral Cipher, which is here disclosed for the first time, were written by the Freedmans fully endorsing its presence in the Shakespeare works. The Freedmans ensured this remained hidden through their book, the Shakespeare Ciphers Examined, which is itself paradoxically an 
elaborate cryptogram containing concealed Baconian ciphers repeatedly conveying the message that Francis Bacon is Shakespeare. The freedmen secretly knew there were Baconian ciphers present in the Shakespeare works and that Bacon is the true author of the Shakespeare works, a secret which at a single stroke completely collapses the Stratfordian illusion that the illiterate, semi-illiterate William Shakespeare of Stratford was the author of the Shakespeare poems and plays. It was a secret the freedmen publicly lied about for the rest of their lives, which they took to their graves, but not beyond it. For, on the tombstone of William and Elizabeth Friedman, designed by themselves, the two greatest cryptographers of the 20th century left a cryptographic message, Francis Bacon is Shakespeare. It is, it is a story told here for the first time that will completely shock the Shakespeare world. From a very early age, Francis Bacon was given a baptism into ciphers and codes and other arcane cryptic devices for concealing and communicating secret information. His father, Lord Keeper and de facto Lord Chancellor of England, Sir Nicholas Bacon, and his uncle, Sir William Cecil, were the twin pillars of the Elizabethan Reformation and effectively the heads of the secret state. The lifeblood of the Elizabethan state and the English Secret Service, headed by its three principal figures, Bacon, Cecil and Walsingham, went to extraordinary lengths to maintain a cryptographic hegemony over their dangerous European rivals and domestic enemies of the English government. Early in the Elizabethan reign, Sir William Cecil and Sir Nicholas Bacon directed the great mathematician and cryptographic expert Dr John Dee to seek out an extremely rare manuscript of Johannes Trithemius's Steganographia. The spy intelligencer and secret government agent Dr Dee had a profound and extensive interest in cryptology and after tracking down the prized manuscript on the continent, he returned with it to England, where a copy of it was placed in the hands of his political masters. Dr. Dee was afterwards mentor to the young Francis Bacon, who possessed an all-consuming and profound fascination for all ciphers and codes and other cryptographic devices necessary for a life in the English Secret Service. In 1576, a 15-year-old Francis Bacon travelled in the train of the ambassador-elect Sir Amias Paulet for a three-year stay at the English Embassy in Paris, which stood at the very epicentre of European intrigue and espionage, where he was joined by the great English cryptographer Thomas Phillips. At the English Embassy in Paris, the two of them were conversing and working daily with the secret language of ciphers. Still then only in his early 20s, Phillips was already known in high private circles as the greatest cryptanalyst in England. Working closely alongside his young friend who shared his profound fascination with cryptology, the conversation naturally turned not only to the available manuscripts and printed works on the subject, it positively extended to all that was then known about cipher and their possibilities. From his own account back in Paris, Bacon's mind had turned to the infinite possibilities of cryptology and to the invention of new ciphers. Years later, in his De Augmentis, Bacon provides a detailed expl explanation of his biliteral cipher, which I devised myself when I was at Paris in my early youth, a cipher system he later secretly inserted into his Shakespeare works. Professors Jardine and Stewart inform us, it was in France that Francis had his first experience of ciphers and cryptography, which were to play such an important role not only in his later life, but also in his posthumous reputation as a shadowy figure whose authorial identity is cryptically contained in anything from the works of Shakespeare to the Rosicrucian Manifesto. In this field, he was lucky to strike up an early relationship with the Grand Master of Intelligence Ciphers, Thomas Phillips, a servant of Sir Francis Walsingham, who had been placed with the embassy to give it the benefits of his skills in languages and ciphering. An integral element of Phillips's prowess in cryptanalysis was his mastery of the various languages in which the European powers operated, 
at least French, Italian, Spanish, Latin and German. What Francis learned under Thomas Phillips remained with him for the rest of his life. Living in Paris at the time when Bacon was busy working with and inventing new ciphers was the diplomat and cryptographer Blaise de Vignere, with whom Bacon is believed to have collaborated on his trait de chiffre or secret ways of writing. In 1591 there appeared in London a Latin edition of a milestone work on cryptology by the Italian polymath and playwright Della Porta, entitled De Fertivis Literatum Notis, printed by John Wolfe, with whom Bacon and his uncle Sir William Cecil Lord Burley had a clandestine and secret relationship, dedicated to Henry Percy, Earl of Northumberland. Some two centuries later, there was discovered at Northumberland House what has come to be known as the Northumberland Manuscript that originally contained a substantial number of Bacon's writings, including his Shakespeare plays Richard II and Richard III. On the outer cover of the Northumberland Manuscript, the name of Bacon, Francis Bacon and his pseudonym Shakespeare, William Shakespeare, are scribbled across it on more than a dozen occasions. Down the left side appears a variant of the long word in Love Labour's Lost. Further down appears the entry Revealing Day Through Every Cranny Peeps and See Shack, line 1086 of The Rape of Lucretia. In particular, above the entry for the Shakespeare play Richard II, appears the entry by Mr Francis William Shakespeare, and further down the word your is twice written across his pseudonym William Shakespeare, so it reads your William Shakespeare. After the death of spymaster Sir Francis Walsingham, the headquarters of the English Secret Service had been transferred to Essex House on the Strand, the grand stately residence of the royal favourite Robert Devereux, Earl of Essex. Under the roof of Essex House, Francis and Anthony Bacon ran a vast domestic and foreign intelligence network of spies and intelligencers operating across the European continent. Working from the headquarters of the English Secret Service, Francis and Anthony also set up a literary workshop with connections to English printers and publishers, employing writers, translators, scribes and copyists for distribution of private manuscripts, books, plays, masks and other entertainments. This Bacon Essex circle included the Earl of Southampton, to whom Bacon dedicated Venus and Adonis and the Rape of Lucretia. The first narrative Shakespeare poem, Venus and Adonis, printed by Richard Field in 1593, marked the first appearance of the pseudonym William Shakespeare in print, appearing under the dedication to Southampton, who in the years leading up to it was residing with Bacon at Gray's Inn, with the two of them involved in a long intimate relationship, much of it centred in and around Essex House. Francis and Anthony Bacon were now the joint heads of the foreign and domestic arms of the English Secret Service, which evolved into British intelligence, thus in modern terms the equivalent of MI5 and MI6. The Bacon brothers were in charge of gathering int intelligence domestically and from all over Europe, for which they employed a highly organised network of secret agents and spies, whose important intelligence and information was conveyed through secret codes and ciphers, with the interception of ciphered correspondence of enemy agents deciphered by Francis, Anthony and Thomas Phillips. In his first major acknowledged work, The Advancement of Learning, Bacon sets out a series of cipher systems, which he named Simple Cipher, K Cipher, Wheel Cipher and his Biliteral Cipher, that he later secretly incorporated into the 1623 Shakespeare First Folio. Shortly before the publication of the Shakespeare First Folio in November 1623, there appeared in Latin Bacon's truly monumental De Augmentis Scientiarum, which included a more expansive and detailed explanation of his biliteral cipher. Bacon's discussion on ciphers is deliberately formatted to commence on page 277, a double cipher for Francis Bacon, 100, William Shakespeare, 177.
The third in an interconnected trinity of publications following the Shakespeare First Folio and De Augmentis Scientiarum came not long after in the shape of the extremely rare work on cryptology, one still shrouded in secrecy and mystery, entitled Cryptomenaces by Gustavus Solenus, a pseudonym for Augustus Duke of Brunswick Lundberg, a near 500-page work published at Lundberg early in 1624. Its revealing title page contains a pictorial cryptogram depicting Francis Bacon giving a figure holding a spear dressed in actor's boots, representing the actor William Shakespeare, a quarto or book of plays, who is shown carrying them off into the distance towards a building representing the Globe Theatre. Several experts, including the cryptographer Charles Bowditch, the Dutch professor of mathematics and 17th century cipher expert Dr. Speckman, Professor Pierre Henrion of Versailles University, a member of the French cipher service in the Second World War, the Baconian code and cipher expert Thomas Bokenham, and Peter Dawkins, founder director of the Francis Bacon Research Trust, a recognised expert on Bacon, Shakespeare and the Rosicrucians, as well as renowned authority on all aspects of Baconian cryptology, have all identified and confirmed numerous ciphers relating to Bacon and his Shakespeare plays in cryptology. Menaces. The De Augmentis, which produced for the first time a detailed and expansive explanation of Bacon's biliteral cipher, was later published in Holland in 1645. The figure representing Bacon on the title page of the Cryptomenaces is here seated in front of his Shakespeare first folio, with his left hand controlling his literary mask William Shakespeare, clad in an actor's goatskin, holding a clasped book like the old Masonic rituals, symbolising his Rosicrucian Freemasonry Brotherhood, who very closely guard and watch over his secret life and writings, including his concealed authorship of the Shakespeare works. The extensive evidence and information given above, nearly all of which is not found in the Shakespearean ciphers examined by the fraudulent Freemans, itself invalidates and demolishes their carefully constructed charade. But they were just mere pawns in a much wider and complex illusion, one which has deceived and beguiled the rest of the world for the last 450 years. Some three centuries after the publication of the Shakespeare First Folio, the presence of Bacon's biliteral cipher therein was published by the remarkable Elizabeth Wells Gallup, entitled The Biliteral Cipher of Sir Francis Bacon Discovered in His Works. On examining the prefatory material of the Shakespeare First Folio, Gallup deciphered a series of revelations about Lord Bacon's secret life and enormous corpus of writings, revealing that not only was he the secret author of the Shakespeare works, but also the works published in the names of, among others, Spencer, Green and Marlowe, and that he was the concealed royal son of Queen Elizabeth and Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester. News of these revelations soon reached the ears of Colonel George Fabian, who had set up his Riverbank estate located west of Chicago, which is still shrouded in secrecy and mystery to the present day. It was here that Colonel Fabian provided Gallup with a staff and extensive resources to continue her investigations into the Bacon Biliteral Cipher and its presence in the Shakespeare works and other Baconian publications set forth anonymously or in the names of others. She was afterwards joined at Riverbank by William F. Friedman and his future wife Elizabeth Smith, the widely acclaimed duo who went on to become the two greatest cryptographers of the 20th century and authors of the Shakespearean ciphers examined. The years spent by the Freedmans at Riverbank are not well documented, and what we know or believe of their time there almost entirely derives from the story told by the Freedmans themselves in a series of unpublished manuscripts and lectures, and their book, The Shakespearean Ciphers Examined.
For the next few years, the Freedmans worked closely alongside Elizabeth Wells Gallup, assisting her in a complex and minute study of the Bacon biliteral cipher and its links to the Shakespeare First Folio. Soon after, the Freedmans were appointed the joint heads of the Riverbank Cipher Department. During this period, the Riverbank Cipher Department, headed by the Freedmans, produced a series of pamphlets known as the Riverbank Laboratory's publications on cryptography. These comprise of a series of important groundbreaking technical monographs dealing with cryptography and cryptanalysis and several dealing with Gallup's work on the Bacon Biliteral Cipher. A number of the volumes on the Bacon Biliteral Cipher were issued anonymously and the identity of their author, who were of course known to the Freedmans, remain unknown to the world at large to the present day. In their typescript entitled The Cryptologist Looks at Shakespeare, held in the Folger Shakespeare Library, on which their book The Shakespearean Ciphers Examined is based, the Freedmans list the series of technical works which began with number 15. These publications dealing with cryptography and cryptanalysis as technical fields in cryptology were as follows. All except numbers 19, 21, 50 and 75 were by William F. Friedman. Number 19 was by Lennox R. Lure and William Friedman. Number 21 was by William F. Friedman and Elizabeth S. Friedman. Numbers 50 and 75, not cryptographic, strictly speaking, were by H. O. Nolan. As one would expect, the Freedmans had no difficulty whatsoever in identifying those works written by Mr. Friedman, as well as the works he closely collaborated with Mrs. Friedman, and the names of those other authors who had written works placed in this category. The information concerning the Riverbank publications dealing with the Bacon Biliteral Cipher is contradictory and to the present day their number remains uncertain, with their number differing according to which source one examines. If we turn to the Freedman's book, The Shakespearean Ciphers Examined, the source of information for nearly all scholarly and ordinary inquiries, the title, author and date of publication of the Baconian Riverbank publications is briefly mentioned in only two places throughout the whole work. The information, rather than being clear, detailed and precise, as one would expect from two cryptologists who place great emphasis on the critical critical importance of accuracy, it is inconsistent and conspicuously deficient in several important points of detail. Firstly, they say, and I hear quoting full, while she, Mrs. Gallup, was there, Fabian issued in his series of Riverbank publications six small items relating to the biliteral cipher. Not a single mention of the individual's title, date of publication or author of any of the six works. One of which could hardly be described as small, running as it does to 100 pages. In between the 32 pages when the Freedmans next make brief mention of the Riverbank Bacon Biliteral Cipher publications, the number had mysteriously reduced to five, and here again I quote in full. There were five of them, four dealing with what was called the greatest work of Sir Francis Bacon and one called Ciphers for the Little Folks. This in a book run into 303 pages in which its final six chapters are assigned to their time at Riverbank, wherein the Freedmans devote a mere two sentences to the five or six works into the investigations of the Bacon Biliteral Cipher. This remarkable fact alone should have raised huge red flags in the minds of Shakespeare scholars, the international press and the rest of the deceived world. Writing in their unpublished The Cryptologist Looks at Shakespeare, on which their book The Shakespeare Ciphers Examined is based, the fraudulent Freemans include more information, albeit still inaccurate and incomplete, which they chose to suppress in their book once again here quoted in full. These publications dealing with the biliteral cipher were as follows. J.A. Powell, The Greatest Work, anonymous, hints to the, to the decipherer. 
Mrs. Henry Pott, hints for deciphering, Anonymous, the keys for deciphering, Dorothy Crane, ciphers for the little folks. As seen above, there are only five, not six titles listed, and one of these was not even published by Riverbank Laboratories. Of the five that are listed above, three of the publications have the name of their author listed on the respective title pages. Why, when the Freedmans were the Cipher Bureau at Riverbank, a bureau headed by the Freedmans, are two of the tracks listed as anonymous? Undoubtedly, the Freedmans knew the identity of the author or authors of these publications, so why did they not name them in either the unpublished typescript or their universally celebrated book? Why the conspiracy of silence? The silence and secrecy which has continued to surround the Freedmans and their time spent at Riverbank has been further exacerbated by the inaccessibility of the Riverbank publications on the Bacon by Literal Cipher. It is virtually impossible to purchase a full set of the six Riverbank publications on the rare book market, and the full set has not been reprinted. The inaccessibility of these publications is further compounded by the remarkable fact that copies of the six are not listed or held by leading libraries in the UK. For example, the British Library hold no copies of any of these six Riverbank works, and nor does the Cambridge University Library. The Bodleian Library holds a single copy of the Keys for Deciphering the Greatest Work of Sir Francis Bacon, and a single copy of the Fundamental Principles of Baconian Ciphers is held by the University of London. So in total, the leading English libraries hold only two of the six Baconian Riverbank publications. Nor does any US library hold a copy of all six Riverbank publications on Bacon's Biliteral Cipher. The scarcity and inaccessibility, together with the lack of complete and accurate information regarding the Baconian Riverbank publications, only partly explains why so little is known about these works and their content. Regrettably, the Freedmans, who jointly headed the Riverbank Cipher Department and played an integral part in their production, throughout their whole lifetime chose to remain steadfastly silent on what is still the most important secret about these anonymous Riverbank publications, the secrecy of their authorship. To understand why this secrecy was systematically maintained by the Freedmans, we need to turn our attention to the works themselves and examine their contents to fully reveal the identity of the individuals responsible for these anonymous works on the Bacon by Literal Cipher. But before we proceed to examine the aforementioned anonymous publications, the 14-page pamphlet The Greatest Work of Sir Francis Bacon, published by the Riverbank Laboratories by J. A. Powell, is of a great deal of interest. This work gives rise to a series of subtle deceptions perpetrated by the Freedmans, designed to withhold important information about its author and his undoubted expertise in the area of codes and ciphers in general and the Baconian by literal cipher in particular. The Freedmans were very familiar with J.A. Powell from their days at Riverbank, and in the Shakespearean ciphers examined, they twice quote from the above work, but only once mention his name in the text as follows. J.A. Powell says of this stage, Blink and you might have missed it. The same quote used in the book is also found in their manuscript on which it is based. This is all the Freedmans have to say about J.A. Powell, but this time without even naming him. As one observer remarked, the cipher came with the same effect as does a bright light to one who has lost his way in the dark night. What the Freedmans clearly did not want to convey to their readers was that Captain J.A. Powell was a renowned and recognised expert cryptographer and worked in the code and cipher section for US military intelligence, MI8, in the First World War. Captain Powell was commissioned by Fabian to examine the work of Gallup on the Bacon by Literal Cipher. His findings were afterwards published in The Greatest Work of Sir Francis Bacon. It commences with an introduction headed The Great Work, Its Discovery, in which Captain Powell fully and unreservedly endorses Elizabeth Wells Gallup's work on the Bacon by Literal Cipher. 
to Elizabeth Wells Gallup, a deeply read student of English literature, to whom belongs the enduring credit of discovering the existence and the solution of the Baconian biliteral cipher. Captain Powell's booklet contains a demonstration of the application of the decipherment of the prologue to Troilus and Cressida in the 1623 Shakespeare folio. As known to those familiar with the first folio, the page is printed in italic type. Using rigidly scientific principles, Gallup proceeded to examine the page and classify the A and B form to reveal a deciphered message. The decipherment is set out letter by letter by Captain Powell in the appendix. In their book, The Shakespearean Ciphers Examined, the fraudulent Freeman stated that the biliteral cipher was never used or inserted by Bacon in the Shakespeare plays or in his own acknowledged works, which was very different to what was stated by the concealed authors of the anonymous works of the Riverbank publications on the Bacon biliteral ciphers whom the freedmans knew well, as well as they knew themselves, a truth they concealed and lied about to everyone else, a secret which defined them, and one that could never be openly revealed to the rest of the world. The 15-page anonymous hints to the, the decipherer of the greatest work of Sir Francis Bacon, published in 1916, begins by stating its clear objective in the kind of language and methodical approach one would expect from William Friedman, with its emphasis on the mindset and scientific implements required for the systematic task at hand. In very familiar terms, its anonymous author then sets out the works that the student requires to familiarise themselves with, the Bacon Biliteral Cipher. The 1623 edition of De Augmentis, translated by Gilbert Watts in 1640, and Spedding's edition of the Bacon Works, where the Biliteral Cipher is reproduced and explained. The pamphlet also contains general instructions for the study of the biliteral cipher and includes several plates of italic and Roman type letters to assist the student to differentiate between the different types found in Elizabethan and Jacobean works. Additional plates reproduce Bacon's passage on ciphers in The Advancement of Learning and the cipher passage found in Spedding's translation of De Augmentis. The same material was decades later similarly presented by William Friedman in his lecture, The Earliest Attempts at Cryptography, From the Invention of the Art of Writing to Bacon's Biliterary Cipher. The hints to the decipherer of the greatest work of Sir Francis Bacon includes an explanation of the biliteral alphabet and how he resorted to the use of two forms of type found in works of the period. It contains several plates reproduced from the 1640 edition by Gilbert Watts and from the Spedding edition, as well as providing plates illustrating the minute differences in Italic and Roman type. It contains material and examples that Friedman again later used in his private lecture, the earliest attempts at cryptography from the invention of the art of writing to Bacon's biliteral cipher, and by the Friedmans in both their unpublished typescript, A Cryptographer Looks at Literature, and their book, The Shakespearean Ciphers Examined. The third anonymously issued The Keys for Deciphering the Greatest Work of Sir Francis Bacon is of a very different order to the previously published pamphlets. The book, amounting to a total of 100 pages, is the result of an enormous amount of industry and expertise originating from the Riverbank Cipher Department, headed by William F. Friedman and Elizabeth S. Friedman, whose fingerprints are found all over it. The Keys for Deciphering the Greatest Work of Sir Francis Bacon displays all the confirmatory telltale signs of the, of the hallmarks and characteristics of a work written by William Friedman, with the assistance of his wife Elizabeth Friedman, reflected in his and their later publications, including the Shakespearean ciphers examined.
The reason the freedmen spent a lifetime concealing the identity of the authors of the keys for deciphering the greatest work of Sir Francis Bacon is because it categorically and emphatically states that the Bacon by literal cipher is demonstrably found in certain works published in the Elizabethan period, which they afterwards categorically and repeatedly denied in the Shakespearean ciphers examined. In knowingly perpetrating a massive fraud against Baconian and Shakespearean scholars all around the world that continues unchecked to the present day. Its content, subject matter, mental habits, syntax language, turns of phrase, favourite words and expressions, all undeniably and irrefutably point to and confirm the identity of its anonymous authors, William F. Friedman and his wife Elizabeth S. Friedman. Its primary authorship by William Friedman is betrayed and exposed from its opening paragraph. After several years of a minute study of the general subject of ciphers, especially such as appear in books published in the Elizabethan period, we have arrived at the following conclusions which are submitted with diffidence, but nevertheless with complete confidence. Number one, that ciphers of all kinds were in general use in the 15th, 16th and 17th centuries among those who lay claim to any degree of education and culture. Number two, that the biliteral cipher of Sir Francis Bacon, as described in his De Augmentis Scientiarum, is present in certain works published in the Elizabethan period, and that its presence is susceptible of demonstration to anyone with a mind trained to scholarly investigation and with the ordinary powers of observation. Note the word diffidence in the line, we have arrived at the following conclusions which we submit with diffidence. The word diffidence was a favourite of William F. Friedman's, which he again used with emphasis in one of his lectures discussing the Bacon by literal cipher. If you'd like to learn more about this theory, I suggest with some diffidence that you read a book entitled The Shakespearean Ciphers Examined. I use the word diffidence because my wife and I wrote the book, which was published in late 1957 by Cambridge University Press. The rest of the prefatory note provides an overview and summary of the systematic scholarly and scientific methods employed in determining the presence of Bacon's biliteral cipher in Elizabethan and Jacobean literature, including his acknowledged and pseudonymous writings, among them his Shakespeare poems and plays. Most of the work so far accomplished by Riverbank Laboratories has been confined to the cipher described by Sir Francis Bacon in his Advancement of Learning and called by him the biliteral cipher, and which has been tested and dissected until now its presence in certain works is demonstrable beyond any doubt. As the 20th century began to draw to a close, the publication of a work entitled The Sabines at Riverbank, Their Role in the Science of Architectural Acoustics by John W. Kopeck went virtually unnoticed by the outside world at large. The book, issued in 1997 by the Acoustical Society of America, was limited to only a thousand copies on a subject which falls outside the scope of literary scholarship and is one of the reasons it remains unknown to Baconian and Shakespearean scholars. At its date of publication, the author had spent nearly 25 years at Riverbank and held the position of curator of the Riverbank Museum. Among other interesting items, the Riverbank Museum holds artefacts and unique archives discovered in long forgotten storage rooms at the Riverbank Laboratories. In addition to his professional duties, Kopeck fully immersed himself in the history of Riverbank, a history which had barely been glanced at. Virtually all of what little is known of the Riverbank Cipher Department has come, come down to us through the lens of the Freedmans. 
Their three main repositories, where they discuss their time at Riverbank, provide us with only a very carefully edited version of the circumstancing and circumstances and events surrounding it, and their parts played in the authorship of the Riverbank publications on the Bacon by Literal Cipher. Their various accounts about their time at Rivbank are marked by inconsistency, factual dis discrepancy, deliberate omissions, falsehoods and out-and-out -out mendacity. Now here for the very first time was a book on Rivbank by an author who had spent more than two decades on site with unlimited access to what rec records remained of its secret, obscure and hidden past. The book is dedicated to Don Williams, the son of Fabian chauffeur Bert Williams, who drove the limousine that picked up Elizabeth Smith Friedman from the Newbury Library in Chicago, marking the start of her career at Riverbank from 1916 to 1920. The long-time Riverbank chauffeur Bert Williams knew the Freedmans well, and for the years the Freedmans were at Riverbank, Bert Williams was in almost daily contact with them, as he was with Elizabeth Wells Gallup, providing him with first-hand inside information about the Riverbank publications on the Bacon by Literal Ciphers and their authorship. Outside of the records, Don Williams, Mr Riverbank, who was born there in 1920, was a critical source of information for COPEC. Don, Mr Riverbank Williams, worked at Riverbank for 35 years before retiring in 1985 and knew more about Riverbank than any other person alive. COPEC's informative discussions with Don Williams included the following explosive and far-reaching statement of absolutely enormous historical importance to Baconian and Shakespearean scholarship and the truth about Bacon's authorship of the Shakespeare works, namely the anonymous The Greatest Work of Sir Francis Bacon, issued by the Riverbank Cipher Department, was written by the Freedmans, confirming the Bacon by literal cipher in the Shakespeare canon. When discussing the Baconian ciphers, the Freedmen stated that they spent years working on Bacon's writings and the results of their efforts were documented by them. However, when their book The Greatest Work of Sir Francis Bacon was printed in 1916, the author listed was George Fabian, meaning it was issued under the copyright of George Fabian. For the rest of their lives, the Freedmans remained silent about their authorship of the greatest work of Sir Francis Bacon, which endorsed the presence of the Bacon by Literal Cipher in the Shakespeare works. Then, decades later, when Colonel Fabian and Elizabeth Wells Gallup were long dead, they wrote the Shakespearean Ciphers Examined, in which they fraudulently pretended to the opposite position and completely lied to the whole world. After decades working for the government and US intelligence, in the late 1940s, the Freedmans again turned their attentions to the subject instrumental in bringing them together, decades earlier at the Riverbank Estate, namely the subject of whether there were Baconian ciphers in the Shakespeare and various other Elizabethan works. This was a time when the Freedmans felt persecuted by the National Security Agency, who did not trust them. Freedmen drank too much and they constantly worried and obsessed about money and their finances. We catch a stark picture of his fragile mental health and psychological and emotional instability in some incoherent ramblings, scribbled down on a piece of loose paper later found in the Freedmen archives. Have insight into what is wrong, but it doesn't help much. My nervousness, depression, at times despondency, frightening to be alone, suicidal thoughts, realisation of how wrong that would be in all respects. Flight, fight or neurosis. For 50 years have struggled with this off and on. Nevertheless have accomplished great deal, my reputation, but feeling of being has been unendurable. Jealousy of men who have been able to retire and go to other jobs of usefulness and carry on, but not I. Why am I driven so by feeling that I must continue to garner laurels? Repression by secrecy, restrictions, fear of death, no, fear of living on self-pity, realisation that my fear of going out is only a reflection of psychic feeling of insecurity.
His biographer, Ronald W. Clark, informs us, By Christmas 1949, he was profoundly depressed, and by the following months appears to have been considering suicide again. He entered Mount Alto Hospital voluntarily. Movement to an open ward from which he could make weekend visits to his home failed to improve matters very much, and in March 1950 he entered the psychiatric unit of George Washington University Hospital for electroshock therapy. He received a total of six electroshock treatments, each without incident or complication, says his psychiatrist. He made a rapid and dramatic recovery and was discharged from the hospital on April the 11th. The dangerous corner turned, he now faced the Shakespeare controversy once more. It was no coincidence that Shakespearean ciphers examined by the Freedmans was published in the year 1957. The year and number, as we are talking about an important work on Rosicrucian Baconian ciphers, is an auspicious one. Some three decades after the supposed death of Bacon, Dr. Rawley, a member of his Rosicrucian Brotherhood, who secretly knew Bacon penned the Shakespeare works and was familiar with his cipher systems, published the first English biography of Bacon in 1657. A century later, the Freemason Louis Theobald set forth his eight-volume edition of the works of Shakespeare in 1757, replete with Baconian Rosicrucian ciphers. His editor and biographer, James Spedding, issued the first of his seven volumes of the works of Francis Bacon in 1857, which also contained secret Baconian Rosicrucian ciphers, conveying the cryptographic message, Bacon wrote the Shakespeare works. The cryptographic and numerical pattern was repeated once more when the Shakespearean ciphers examined by the Freedmans was published by Cambridge University Press in 1957. What the world doesn't know and will be revealed here for the first time is this book written by the cryptographers William and Elizabeth Friedman also includes hidden Baconian Rosicrucian ciphers which secretly convey that Bacon is Shakespeare. The occult signific significance of the years 1657, 1757, 1857 and 1957 is if the second digit of each of these years is removed, it leaves the special number 157, representing Fra Rosy Cross or Brother of the Rosy Cross, in simple cipher, indicating that the Rosicrucian Brotherhood founded by Bacon were instrumental in the publication of these works, who then and now carefully guard over the secret of his life and writings, including his concealed authorship of the Shakespeare canon. The Shakespearean Ciphers Examined was published on the carefully selected date of the 4th of October 1957. The reason for the publication date was twofold. Firstly, there are seven letters in October and the addition of the numbers in the date, 4 plus 1 plus 9 plus 5 plus 7 equals 26. 7 plus 26 equals 33, Bacon in simple cipher. And as we have seen, if the null 9 is dropped from the date, 1957, it leaves the secret Rosicrucian number, 157 Fra Rosy Cross in simple cipher. Predictably and inevitably, the Shakespearean ciphers examined was met with a chorus of universal praise from the international press, reviewers, commentators and academics. They were all agreed the book had finally put to rest once and for all the Baconian controversy. The New York Times book review stated the Freedmans buried these pseudo-cryptograms beneath a mass of evidence as crushing as an avalanche. The commendations it received were not so much based upon a critical evaluation of the work's merits. In virtually all instances, the critics and reviewers were woefully ill-equipped to evaluate the finer points of cryptology, of which they knew very little, and the finer points of evidence demonstrating Bacon's authorship of the Shakespeare works, of which they knew less. Rather, they were all merely swept along by the airy wind of reputation. So, let us re-examine the Shakespearean Ciphers Examined, a work on cryptography, or codes and ciphers, by the two greatest cryptographers of the 20th century, beginning with its title page, replete with Baconian Rosicrucian ciphers. 
For the purposes of encipherments, the title page is divided into halves above and below the Cambridge University crest. In the top half of the title page, there are 33 words printed in block capitals, 33 bacon in simple cipher, comprising of 190 letters. 190 minus 33 equals 157 Fra Rosy Cross. In the bottom half of the page, there are 29 block capital letters and four digits in the date. 29 plus 4 equals 33, bacon in simple cipher. The whole page contains a total of 38 block capital words and one ampersand. 38 plus 1 equals 39, F bacon in simple cipher. Moreover, the 190 block capital letters in the top half of the page minus the 29 block capital letters and the four digits in the date of the bottom half, 190 minus 33 equals 157 for our rosy cross in simple cipher. If we turn to the first page of the preface commencing the work, it will immediately be observed that the first letter on the first line is a very large capital F, and the first letter on the last line in the paragraph is a B in Believe, providing the initials of Francis Bacon. Below the large capital F, if we use the D as a reverse B, we have the letters C-O-A-N-B, an anagram of Bacon, thus giving us F Bacon. Within the large capital F, there is a total of 135 Roman letters and two capital letters. 135 minus 2 equals 133, a double cipher for Francis Bacon, 100, Bacon, 33 in simple cipher. The whole paragraph contains a total of 67 words, 67 Francis in simple cipher. Similarly, the last paragraph has a total of 67 words, again Francis in simple cipher, and if we subtract the one word in quotation marks inside, 67 minus 1 equals 66, a double cipher for Bacon 33, Bacon 33 in simple cipher. The whole page contains 33 lines of printed text, again Bacon in simple cipher. Finally, the last printed line of text contains 46 letters and beneath it in Roman numerals V11 for number 7. 46 plus 7 equals 53, an occult number in Baconian Rosicrucian Freemasonic circles denoting the letters SOW in simple cipher, standing for Sons of Wisdom or members of Bacon's Bacon Rosicrucian Freemasonry Society. The first page of the introduction likewise comprises 33 lines of printed text, 33 Bacon in simple cipher. It commences with a very large capital S as part of the word Shakespearean in block capital letters, followed by scholars also in block, block capital letters. Within the very large capital S, there is a total of 25 words and 109 Roman letters. 25 plus 109 equals 134, which minus the S produces a count of 133, a double cipher for Francis Bacon, 100 Bacon 33 in simple cipher. If we now take a look in a straight line beneath the capitalised Shakespearean, we see the letters A, B and C, an anagram of the contraction BAC indicating Bacon. And below the letter C, the word is and below this, slightly to the left, the letters C-O-N. Thus, we are able to discern the hidden message, Bacon is Shakespeare. To reinforce this, directly beneath the letter C-O-N, there is another group of letters, C-A-N-O-B, which is another anagram for Bacon, allowing us to read up the page again that Bacon is Shakespeare. From this, the fraudulent freedmans make the following statement. Shakespearean scholars have often had to deal with arguments that Shakespeare did not have the birth, breeding or education necessary to write the plays. The evidence brought forward by both sides in this particular argument is necessarily conjectural and must therefore always be inconclusive. On the other hand, claims based on cryptography can be scientifically examined and proved or disproved. 
In this book, we examine the cryptographic evidence used to support the thesis that someone other than Shakespeare wrote the plays. The previous statement from the Freedmans is inaccurate, misleading and false. In addition to contemporary manuscripts, documents, textual, paratextual, styles, subject matter, content, parallels, correspondences and resemblances, of which there are more than a thousand examples, the evidence for Bacon's authorship of the Shakespeare plays is irrefutable, the vast majority of which is unknown to so-called Shakespeare authorities and experts, the general reader and the rest of the world at large. The last part of their statement, as any professional cryptographer would know, is a blatant lie, i.e. claims, meaning about literary ciphers, based on cryptography can be scientifically examined and proved or disproved. We need do no more than quote Elizabeth Friedman herself from her unpublished manuscript many years before the Friedmans decided to lie to the world in their book. Literary ciphers may give you the swing of the thing, but they are in no sense scientific. As the Freedmans were only all too perfectly aware, 16th and 17th century literary codes and ciphers demand a wide and serious knowledge and understanding of the subject, combined with experience, common sense and judgment, in order to critically evaluate them in context upon their individual merits. With the prefatory matter and introduction concluded, the Freedmans proceed to give in their first chapter entitled The Great Controversy, a fraudulent account of the great history of the Shakespeare authorship controversy. As with the first page of the preface and first page of the introduction, the first page of the first chapter contains 33 printed lines of text, 33 Bacon in simple cipher. And similarly, within its very large capital I, there are 139 letters, a double cipher for Francis Bacon 100, F Bacon 39. The Freedmans begin their first chapter with a deliberately misleading and fraudulent statement. It seems that the first man to question Shakespeare's sole authorship of the plays was a certain Captain Golding. In a small book called An Essay Against Too Much Reading, published in 1728, he hinted at one of the anti-Stratfordian arguments. Contrary to the Freedman's statement, the poet and dramatist John Marston and satirist and moralist Joseph Hall revealed that Bacon, who they both personally knew, was the author of the Shakespeare narrative poems Venus and Adonis and the Rape of Lucretia in a series of satires published between 1597 and 1599. This is just one of numerous textual examples, together with contemporary manuscripts, documents, printed works, as well as frontispieces, emblems and other cryptic devices, many of which are included in the present work, that demolish the illusion that the illiterate, semi-illiterate William Shakespeare was Shakespeare, as well as absolutely confirming he was a literary mask for Bacon. In the second chapter, entitled Cryptology as a Science, the fraudulent Freemans set down the rules of engagement. Consistent with the capital letters commencing the preface, introduction and chapter one, the second ch chapter also begins with a very large capital letter. Within the very large capital letter T, which serves as a cryptogram, wherein the fraudulent Freedmans provide a disingenuous and, and misleading definition of the term cryptology, there is a hidden secret message. Within the very large capital T, there is a sum total of 133 letters, which is a double cipher for Francis Bacon, 100, Bacon, 33. And moreover, it, it comprises 27 words and 130 Roman letters, minus the capital, three capital letters T, H, G. 130 minus 27 equals 103, Shakespeare in simple cipher. And conversely, 130 plus 27 equals 157 Fra Rosy Cross in simple cipher, thus providing the enciphered message that Francis Bacon, brother of the Rosy Cross, is Shakespeare. The text on the whole page comprises a total of 33 lines, 33 Bacon in simple cipher. 
With simply breathtaking arrogance and self-delusion, the fraudulent freedmans on all matters of cryptology appoint themselves and only themselves as the law, the rule makers and judge and jury in their own case. In doing so, they adopt a crude method of arguing in the kind of circles that are both contradictory and self-refuting. In one place, to be sure that a message is deciphered correctly, it must have its rules. And for another kind of cry cryptogram, there are no rules. In another place, the rules must be applied precisely and inflexibly, whereas some systems, the encipherer, and they might have added the decipherer, can exercise his judgment. The Freedman's State Getting a correct solution is not a question of opinion, but a question of proof. He must, in addition, be able to show others that it is the right one. It must be unbiased, systematic and logically sound. It must be free from appeals to insight, clear of guesswork and should avoid imponderables like the plague. In a word, it must be scientific. The impression carefully created in the mind of the reader is cryptology as a science. No matter, the fraudulent freedmans continually undermined and contradicted their own premises of certainty at every turn and resorted to insinuating series upon series of qualifications, making a statement in one place only to negate them in another. However, the underlying message remained. Cryptology was a mathematical science and for the results of the decipherer to, to be valid, they needed to be independently corroborated and confirmed before they could be accepted as valid all of which the freedmans knew to be untrue and false. How then do we know this to be absolutely and demonstrably false? Because William F. Friedman tells us in a work he and his wife Elizabeth Friedman were rightly confident that the Shakespeare schoolmen and the rest of the world were almost certainly unaware of and or never likely to ever read. In the work in question, An Introduction to Methods for the Solution of Ciphers, written during their time at Riverbank, which was not on open sale to the general public and was later classified by the National Security Agency, Friedman did give an accurate and honest account and analysis of the principles of deciphering. In fact, the introduction to this work is arguably the most concise explication and summary of the principles underlying the process of decipherment ever written, which completely confutes and demolishes their central thesis and the other falsehoods and lies peddled to the world in their fraudulent The Shakespearean Ciphers Examined. In the introduction, Friedman states, Deciphering is both a science and an art. It is science because certain definite laws and principles have been established which pertain to it. It is also an art because of the large part played in it by imagination, skill and experience. Yet it may be said that in no other science are the rules and principles so little followed and so often broken, and in no other art is the part played by reasoning and logic so great. In no other science, not even accepting the science of language itself, grammar, does that statement, the exception proves the rule, apply so aptly. Indeed, it may be said, and still be within the limits of the truth, that in deciphering, the rule is the exception. Therefore, only the most generalised rules can ever apply to deciphering operations and there can only be a few guiding principles, which the decipherer should always be ready to modify. It is the facility and ease with which a decipherer is able to modify his methods and discard his assumptions, which differentiates the good decipherer from the poor one. Deciphering is not a process for a one-cylinder mind. In augmenting the wealth of miscellaneous evidence, which in itself serves to reveal Bacon's authorship of Shakespeare, the present work has principally employed two ciphers, the simple cipher and K-cipher, as an independent method of confirmation. Both of these cipher systems are addressed in the Freedman's Folger typescript under the title Numerical Cipher, Seals, Rosicrucian Emblems, Baconian Numerology and in their printed work under the curiously vague shorter title, Odd Numbers. 
In keeping with the previous cryptographic pattern, the first page in this chapter in the book is not without interest. Within the very large capital letter T, there are 31 words, 135 Roman letters and two capital letters T and H. 135 minus 2 equals 133, a double cipher for Francis Bacon, 100 Bacon 33 in simple cipher. The 135 letters minus the 31 words equals 104, which minus the large capital T, 104 minus 1 equals 103 Shakespeare in simple cipher. On the whole page, there are 33 lines of printed text, 33 Bacon in simple cipher. The chapter is given in Roman numerals X11 and it falls on page 169. 169 minus 12 equals 157 Fra Rosy Cross in simple cipher. Thus, the concealed cryptogram yields the hidden message Francis Bacon, brother of the Rosy Cross, is Shakespeare. An illustration of the simple cipher is found in Cryptomenaces, published shortly after the Shakespeare first folio in early 1624, whose title page depicts Bacon giving a figure representing William Shakespeare, a quarto or book of plays, which he is seen riding off into the distance towards the Globe Theatre, where the Shakespeare plays were performed. In Bacon's use and application of the simple cipher, each letter in the 24 Elizabethan letter alphabet is given a numerical value, 1 equals A, 2 equals B, 3 equals C, etc., which he employed to insert several secret Baconian signatures in the early editions of the Shakespeare plays and the Shakespeare first folio. The simple and case cipher systems and their application were discovered nearly 300 years later by Frank Woodward and his brother Parker Woodward. Their findings were issued in two privately circulated works, Secret Shakespearean Seals and Francis Bacon's Cipher Signatures. The K cipher system works on a similar basis to the simple cipher system, where the letters are given a numerical value as follows. In their book, The Shakespearean Ciphers Examined, the Freedmans tried to undermine the simple and K-cipher systems as demonstrated by the Woodwards, by their usual modus operandi of omission, suppression and misrepresentation, and accused them of finding them everywhere. To be precise, what the Woodwards actually found was that Bacon had secretly inserted his simple and K-cipher systems in the Shakespeare poems and plays and other works, revealing and confirming that Bacon is Shakespeare, with the first four pages of the Shakespeare first folio also containing the 157 and 287 counts, representing Fra Rosy Cross in simple and K-cipher. Beginning with the title page of the Shakespeare first folio incorporating the curious Strauchot portrait. 157 Fra Rosy Cross in simple cipher. To the Reader by Ben Johnson, who was living with Bacon at Gorhambury as the first folio was making its way through the Jaggard printing presses. 287 Fra Rosy Cross in K cipher. The first page of the dedication of the first folio to Bacon's lifelong friends William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, then the Grand Master of England, and his brother Philip Herbert, Earl of Montgomery. 157 Fra Rosy Cross in simple cipher. The second page of the dedication to the incomparable brethren, the Grand Master of England, William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, and his brother, Philip Herbert, the Earl of Montgomery. 287 Fra Rosy Cross in K cipher. In keeping with the capital letters commencing the preface, introduction, and other chapters in the Shakespearean ciphers examined, the chapter entitled Acrostics and Anagrams also commences with a large capital letter. Within the large capital A, there are a total of 25 words and 132 letters. 25 plus 132 equals 157, Fra Rosy Cross in simple cipher, and 33 lines of printed text underneath the title of the chapter. 
33 Bacon in Simple Cipher. The simplest form of an acrostic is the use of the initial letter of a line in a poem or prose text to spell out a word, name or some kind of message. Another form of the simple acrostic is the telestic, which takes the final letter of the last word in each line, and the acrotelestic, composed of the initials of the final words in a text. There is also the progressive simple acrostic, which takes the first letter of the first line, the second letter of the second line, the third of the third, etc., and the progressive simple telestic that takes the last letter in the first line, the last but one in the second line, the last but two in the third line, and so on. The Freedmans also set down, in the case of acrostics, any message found must have been inserted by the man who wrote the open text, and to change or insert a hidden message would be impossible without changing the open text itself. If, therefore, any genuine messages of this kind exist, they must be taken as conclusive. An anagram is a word, phrase or name formed using the original letters in a poem or prose text by the process of transposing or rearranging the letters. Even though it is well known and indisputable that various anagrams have been used to conceal and prove authorship, the fraudulent freedmans insist that Anagrammatic methods are too flexible to prove any claim to authorship, since the chances of accidental occurrence must invariably be very high indeed. Just more falsehood until recently that passed for currency in academic Shakespearean circles and the wider world at large. In recent times, a very substantial body of academic literature has been produced by critics and commentators surrounding the subject of Shakespeare and anagrams. In the words of P Professor Fowler in his own influential Literary Names, Personal Names in English Literature, Shakespeare's many anagrams in the sonnets were lost from view for centuries until R. H. Winnock's closely argued article, published in 2009, startled the scholarly world, in which he revealed embedded letter anagrams on Risley. Dr. Winnick, in turn, acknowledges the work of Harvard professor Helen Vendler, The Art of Shakespeare's Sonnets, which proved key to establishing that the sonnets contain numerous instances of anagrammatic wit, of which he provides several examples. As Professor Vendler observed, there is always something cryptographic in Shakespeare's sonnet surfaces, sometimes literally so, as in the anagrams of seven, or as in the play on vile and evil in 121, but more often merely an oddness that catches the eye and begs explanation. The impact of R. H. Winnick's 2009 article on anagrams and Shakespeare's sonnets that had apparently so startled the scholarly world was far exceeded a few years later when William Bellamy published his groundbreaking work Shakespeare's Verbal Art. The important study reveals and explores the anagrammatic devices that lie beneath the surface of all Shakespearean texts and how these subtextual devices help to clarify authorial intention and meaning. As exemplar texts, Bellamy focuses in particular on the sonnets and the plays Hamlet, Othello and Twelfth Night, all of which are written and constructed around various concealed anagrams and other related linguistic and cryptic devices. In his introduction, Bellamy states, This is a book about Shakespeare's virtuosity in the art of anagram. It aims to show how Shakespeare, the greatest poet of his age, may prove also the greatest anagrammatist. As will become clear in later chapters, a conventionally subtextual anagrammatism is not only pervasive in Shakespeare's verse, but is fundamental to his verbal art.
In his literary names, personal names in English literature, under the heading Embedded Anagrams, Professor Fowler produces a number of examples of embedded name anagrams identified by Dr Winnick in the Shakespeare sonnets, before similarly concluding, Shakespeare, the greatest poet of his age, may prove also the greatest anagrammatist. He was undoubtedly the greatest poet and dramatist of his age, or of any age, and our secret Shakespeare was also its greatest literary cryptographer, anagrammatist, and the user of all the various other cryptic devices at his command, when incorporating his secret signatures in the Shakespeare poems and plays. In his first Shakespeare narrative poem, Venus and Adonis, above the dedication to Henry Ridesley, Earl of Southampton, which marked the first time the pseudonym William Shakespeare appeared in print, appears the Baconian AA headpiece, which also adorned a number of the quarto editions of the Shakespeare plays and the Shakespeare first folio. The following year saw the first edition of The Rape of Lucretia, with an even more intimate dedication to Southampton, again signed by Bacon under his pseudonym William Shakespeare. The first two lines of The Rape of Lucretia commence with a monogram, a motive of two or more letters signifying a person's initials used as an overt or cryptic device. The first letter is a very large capital F, and enclosed within it are two other large capital letters R and B. These three letters represent the initials of Francis Bacon, and the two letters commencing the first two lines, F and B, again stand for the name of Francis Bacon. Within the large capital F, there are 66 letters, a double cipher for Bacon, 33, Bacon 33, in simple cipher, which when added to the large capital F, 66 plus 1 equals 67, Francis in simple cipher. On the final page of The Rape of Lucretia, when a line is drawn from a capital F through the B and A and con of its last two lines, it spells out the hidden cryptic signature of F. Bacon. The monogram FRB also appears in the first edition of the Shakespeare Sonnets, below another example of the Baconian Rosicrucian AA headpiece many of which were also clearly addressed to Henry Risley, which is repeatedly confirmed by numerous embedded anagrams revealed by Dr. R. H. Winnick. The large capital F and capital R following the indentation, a capital B again provides the initials of Francis Bacon, the same secret signature which commences the rape of Lucretia. The Shakespeare narrative poem, A Lover's Complaint, was also published as part of the first edition of the Shakespeare sonnets, written in rhyme royal, the same metre as The Rape of Lucretia. The first verse of A Lover's Complaint again commences with a large capital F, and enclosed within it are two other capital letters, R and A. And down below it, the letters which make up my name, and from the B in the third line, reading upwards, A and Con, for Bacon. Thus it reads, my name is Francis Bacon. In the troublesome reign of King John, Bacon explores the law of bastardy, in particular royal bastardy, through the most important and largest role in the play, the royal bastard Sir Philip Falconbridge. The first eight letters of the surname Falconbridge conceals within it an anagram of F. Bacon. In a scene with the royal bastard Sir Philip Falconbridge, its author secretly incorporates reading upwards the anagram Francis Bacon. In Act 1, Scene 1, the royal bastard Sir Philip Falconbridge delivers a soliloquy in which he muses on the reality of the world which now awaits him. In the passage, Bacon incorporates one of his secret signatures in the first letters of the first three lines. The first line, containing the phrase Worshipful Society, an allusion to the Worshipful Society of Freemasons, begins with the letter B, the second with the letters AN and the third line with the letters FO. The rearranged letters spell out FBAON, which is clearly only lacking the letter C for F. Bacon. We do not, however, need to look too hard for the missing C. 
If we return to the first line, the C needed to complete the anagram is the third letter in the final word society, giving us F bacon. And moreover, the numerical, numerical value of the letter C in Roman numerals is 100. Simple cipher for Francis Bacon. Over Christmas 1594-5, Bacon organised and directed the magnificent Christmas grazing revels that premiered his Shakespeare legal play, The Comedy of Errors. On the grand night, the 20th of December 1594, a great presence of lords, ladies and worshipful personages gathered for its performance in the hall to see the premiere of the play with its themes of errors and confusions, later greatly expanded upon by Bacon in The Advancement of Learning. In the opening scene, Bacon leaves his secret signature in the way of the following anagram of Francis Bacon. He also secretly inserts in the last scene of the play the following anagram, Bacon. Just for good measure, Bacon also adds the following passage. 33 years have I but gone to travail. The number 33 is Bacon in simple cipher. During the late 1580s and early 1590s, Bacon began writing the War of the Roses plays, 1 Henry VI, 2 Henry VI, 3 Henry VI and Richard III, otherwise known as the first Shakespeare tetralogy. In the fifth act of 1 Henry VI, he inserts a triple anagram in a single passage. Shortly after, in the fifth act, appears another Baconian anagram. Again, in the fourth act of 2 Henry VI, he incorporates the following anagram of F. Bacon. The concluding play of the first Shakespeare tetralogy, Richard III, whose central character was partly modelled on Bacon's cousin, the hunchback, Sir Robert Cecil. His mother, Lady Mildred Cook, Cook Cecil, was the elder sister of Lady Anne Cook Bacon, whom he grew up with, was written in the early 1590s. It was first printed in 1597 by Valentine Sims for Andrew Wise, without the name of an author on its title page. A second quarto edition appeared in 1598, printed by Thomas Creed for Andrew Wise, this time with the pseudonym William Shakespeare, appearing on its title page, with a Baconian Rosicrucian AA headpiece placed at the top of the first page of the text. If we look more closely at the title page, talk about being hidden in plain sight, we see the secret signature of its true author, Bacon. The title page of the anonymous 1597 edition of Richard II has been specially formatted. The word second has been deliberately separated for the purpose of a secret signature, which upwards reads the name of its concealed author, Bacon. The title page also contains 33 Roman words, 33 Bacon in simple cipher. In the text itself, Bacon inserts the anagram by one Bacon. It was Ben Johnson who said that Bacon could never pass by a jest, and he humorously sends himself up in 1 Henry IV, in which there are 33 instances of his name Francis, 33 Bacon in simple cipher, in the specially formatted first column on page 56, F.R. Bacon in simple cipher, in the Shakespeare first folio. In Act 1, Scene 1, Bacon inserts one of his secret signatures in the form of an anagram. During 1599, Bacon turned to one of the figures in classical history, the Roman leader Julius Caesar, who had clearly fascinated him and had already featured in a wide range of his works. He was familiar with all the standard works on Roman history and Julius Caesar and the critical literary, literature surrounding the subject and the man. Both the Greek and Roman historians Plutarch and Suetonius state Julius Caesar was stabbed 23 times, but in the play this is changed to 33 times, 33 Bacon in simple cipher. 
In the text of the play, our supreme philosopher-poet adroitly inserts a number of his secret signatures in the form of anagrams of Bacon and F. Bacon. In his remains concerning Britain, the historian William Camden, who was something of an expert on the subject, provides numerous examples of Greek and Latin anagrams relating to English royalty and its nobility. No name of an author appears on the title page, however its dedication to the right worshipful, worthy and learned Sir Robert Cotton is signed with the initials MN, the last letters of William Camden. It appears that Bacon was involved in the production of the work as indicated by his Baconian Rosicrucian AA headpiece above the first page of its introduction. We know from Spedding that Bacon and his fellow Rosicrucian brother Camden worked closely together on his Annals of Queen Elizabeth, in which passages by Bacon were inserted in the final printed text. It appears that once again Camden and Bacon worked closely together on the production of the reviewed, corrected and increased 1614 edition of The Remains Concerning Britain, which is adorned with several Bacon Rosicrucian AA headpieces. Two Baconian Rosicrucian AA headpieces appear over the chapter's anagrams and surnames. However, in the case of the latter, it is printed upside down, indicating to the initiated the page contains important secret concealed information about Bacon. On this page, it is written, at which time Romulus took the Sabine name of Quirinus because he used to carry a spear, which the Sabines called Quiris. If we take the two letters of of, the last three letters of Quirinus and the first four of because, it provides an anagram of F. Baconus. In Elizabethan times, Bacon was used for Bacon. Or if we drop the E, it yields F. Baconus, the Latin for F. Bacon. Thus, Camden with Bacon is here linking Bacon with Quirinus, the spearman, or the shaker of the spear, an allusion to Shakespeare. In one of the verses in the Memorai, published by Dr. Rawley shortly after Bacon's recorded death, wherein he is presented as a supreme poet and writer of comedies and tragedies, the poet and dramatist Thomas Randolph, one of Ben Jonson's sons, also selected the term of Quirinus, the spearman, an allusion to Shakespeare when describing Bacon as a divine Minerva, Pallas Athena, the shaker of the spear. When he perceived that the arts were held by no roots and like seeds scattered on the surface of the soil were withering away, he taught the Pegasian arts to grow as grew the spear of Quirinus, i.e. Shakespeare, swiftly into a laurel tree. On the 22nd of January 1621, Bacon celebrated his 60th birthday with a lavish banquet at his official residence York House on the Strand, attended by the great and the good. It is likely that the guest list included several members of his Rosicrucian Freemasonry Brotherhood, including the current Grand Master of England, William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, to whom Bacon jointly dedicated his Shakespeare First Folio. There would also have been a glittering array of poets, including the most important figure regarding the first folio after Bacon himself, the poet and dramatist Ben Jonson, who for Bacon's birthday celebrations wrote an ode entitled Lord Bacon's Birthday, in which he describes him as his king, about whom he says there is some kind of mystery surrounding him. Thou standst as if some mystery thou didst, Give me a deep crowned bowl that I may sing in raising him the wisdom of my king. Following his fall a few months later on the 6th of June 1621, Bacon wrote an astonishing letter to the Spanish ambassador Count Gondomar, in which he explicitly states that he was to devote himself to the actors in reference to the planned Shakespeare first folio. 
For myself, my age, my fortune, yea, my genius, to which I have hitherto done but scant justice, calls me now to retire from the stage of civil action and betake myself to letters and to the instruction of the actors themselves and the service of posterity. In the last five years of his recorded life, Bacon wrote, revised, expanded, translated and published an enormous body of his writings and works in Latin and English. This was carried out in his literary workshop at Gorhambury with the help of his good pens, including the poet and dramatist Ben Jonson, who assisted Bacon in translating his essays, previously printed and published by William and John Jaggard into Latin. The preliminary pages of the Shakespeare first folio consist of a verse signed by Ben Jonson facing the Drowshout portrait. The same poet and dramatist, a member of his Rosicrucian Brotherhood, also provides another long commendatory poem to the memory of my beloved, the author, Mr. William Shakespeare, whom Ben had known for many years to be nothing more than a pseudonym or literary mask for his Rosicrucian Grandmaster, Lord Bacon. In the closing lines, its author, Ben Jonson, has deftly inserted two anagrams, spelling out the name of the true Shakespeare, Bacon. Confirmation, Ben Jonson knew that Shakespeare was a pseudonym or literary mask for his longtime inward friend and Rosicrucian master, Lord Bacon, comes in the same verse. Leave thee alone for the comparison of all that insolent Greece or haughty Rome sent forth, or since did from their ashes come. The words Ben Jonson later employs to describe Bacon in his Timber and Discoveries. He, Bacon, who hath filled up all numbers and performed that in our tongue which may be compared or preferred either to insolent Greece or haughty Rome. It is no coincidence that The Tempest was placed first in the 1623 Shakespeare First Folio. The Rosicrucian Manifesto is perhaps the most Baconian of all the Shakespeare plays. Its central figure, Prospero, is a complex dramatic portrait made in the image of his creator, the scientific philosopher Bacon, founding father of modern science and the modern world. The first play of the Shakespeare first folio commences with a large ornamental B, which when magnified, it reveals the name Francis across the top and Francis at the bottom, and the name Bacon down the right side. On the second page of The Tempest, as printed in the Shakespeare first folio, its concealed author has inserted an anagram spelling out F. Bacon. Just as the poems The Rape of Lucrece, the first sonnet in the Shakespeare sonnets, and first verse of A Lover's Complaint commence with various monograms of Francis Bacon, The Tempest ends with the word free, the name Francis means free, thus giving us, with the first letters of the first and last word of the text, the initials FB, the initials of its secret author, Francis Bacon. Similarly, as we have also seen the use of a large initial capital letter F to indicate the presence of cryptic devices and ciphers, was also employed by Bacon in his early Shakespeare narrative poem, The Rape of Lucrece, the first sonnet in the edition of Shakespeare's sonnets, and as the first letter in the first verse of A Lover's Complaint. The address to the great variety of readers also commences with a large capital F within a woodcut, resulting in the indentation of the first seven lines. The phrase in the first and second line, there you are numbered, also points to the presence of ciphers within the lettered woodblock and the rest of the page. The large capital F with the capital R, as with the previous examples, forms the monogram FR for Francis. The reverse reading under the F lettered woodblock yields B-A-C-O, the contracted name of its author Bacon, and reading downwards the first three lines yield an anagram of Bacon. Thus, the cryptographic message repeatedly conveyed in the address to the great variety of readers pre prefixed to the first folio is Francis Bacon is Shakespeare.
The large capital F standing for Francis is understood by the initiated to represent a secret code whereby concealed and arcane information about Bacon is about to be disclosed for those with eyes to see as understood and practised by the invisible powers truly responsible for the Shakespearean ciphers examined. As we have seen, if we turn to the first page of the preface commencing the work, we see that the first word on the first line is a very large capital F, and the first letter on the last line in the paragraph is a B in Believe, providing the initials of Francis Bacon. The preface and the introduction and each and every one of the 19 chapters in the Shakespeare ciphers examined commences with a large capital letter whose numerical value, value using the Elizabethan 24 letter alphabet produces a total of 277, a double cipher for Francis Bacon 100, William Shakespeare 177 in simple cipher conveying the cryptographic message that Francis Bacon is Shakespeare. The Shakespearean ciphers examined that had denied through its open plain text that there were any Baconian ciphers present in the Shakespearean works was published by Cambridge University Press on the 4th of October 1957. As we have seen, the date, like the rest of the book, is a Baconian Rosicrucian cryptogram. There are seven letters in October and the numbers in the date equal 26. 7 plus 26 equals 33 Bacon in simple cipher. And if the null 9 is dropped from the date, it leaves 157 Fra Rosy Cross in simple cipher, conveying the concealed cryptographic message, Bacon, brother of the Rosy Cross, is Shakespeare. The last full page of text prior to the index in the Shakespearean ciphers examined falls on page 287, Fra Rosy Cross in K cipher. Along the top of the page is written Conclusion, comprising 10 block capital letters. The page number 287 minus 10 equals 277, Francis Bacon 100, William Shakespeare 177 in simple cipher. The last page 288 has 104 words in the text and four block capital words at the top of the page, the Shakespearean ciphers examined. 104 minus 4 equals 100, Francis Bacon in simple cipher. The four block words containing 31 letters subtracted from the page number 288 minus 31 equals 257 Francis Bacon 100 Fra Rosy Cross 157 in simple cipher. The whole book of the Shakespearean ciphers examined, including the index, runs to 303 pages. When the null zero is dropped, it leaves 33 bacon in simple cipher. Thus, repeatedly as seen, the Shakespearean ciphers examined is an enormous cryptogram conveying the secret hidden message that Francis Bacon, brother of the Rosy Cross, is Shakespeare. When William F. Friedman died in 1969 at the age of 78, he was buried with full military honours at Arlington National Cemetery. His widow, Elizabeth S. Friedman, most probably with the help of her husband before he died, designed his gravestone consisting of a pair of crossed flags, the symbol of the Signal Corps, responsible for military communications, mostly in codes and ciphers, and his favourite maxim, Knowledge is Power, expressed by Bacon in Meditation Sacre, first published as part of the first edition of his essays in 1597. On the tombstone, she inserted a secret message using Bacon's biliteral cipher, the cipher system which had first brought them together at Colonel Fabian's Riverbank estate decades earlier, where they headed the Riverbank cipher department. She specified that certain letters were carved with serifs, a slight projection finishing off a stroke of a letter in a typeface, and the rest in sans serif, meaning in the absence of or without any serifs, distinguishing one typeface from another. 
In Bacon's maxim, knowledge is power, using his biliteral cipher, it produces, discounting the last letter R, the following sequence of B-A-B-A-A-A-A-B-A-B, A-A-B-A-B, giving us the letters W-F-F for William F. Friedman. The A and B forms were sketched out by Elizabeth on a surviving piece of paper held in the Elizabeth Smith Friedman Collection at the George C. Marshall Research Foundation. When his wife Elizabeth died in 1980, she was buried alongside her husband and her name and the date of her birth and death were added to the tombstone. Unbeknown to the rest of the world, the tombstone of William F. Friedman and Elizabeth Friedman, the greatest cryptanalysis of the 20th century and authors of the Shakespearean ciphers examined, concealed and reveals another secret cipher message with the most explosive and far-reaching implications, the consequences of which it would be simply impossible to overestimate, which is here revealed for the first time. Let us then take a look at the Freedman's tombstone, which is framed at the top with the insignia of the Signal Corps, whose currencies, codes and ciphers, and at the bottom by the Bacon maxim, knowledge is power, cut in such a way to utilise Bacon's biliteral cipher to incorporate a secret code containing the initials of William F. Friedman. The cryptanalyst forever associated with Baconian ciphers in the Shakespeare works, which in the plain open text of their book, the Freedmans repeatedly denied when they knew the opposite to be true, and throughout their whole lifetimes continued to lie to the rest of the world about it, a secret they took to their graves but not beyond it. The tombstone designed by William and Elizabeth Friedman contains one insignia and a sum total of 16 words and 98 letters. In addition to this, it incorporates four sets of numbers marking the Friedman's birth and death dates. The addition of the four sets of numbers gives a total of 82, and moreover, between these dates appear a total of six dots. When all the characters and numbers are added, it gives a total of 203, producing a double cipher for Francis Bacon 100, Shakespeare 103 in simple cipher. Thus, the tombstone of William F. Friedman and Elizabeth S. Friedman, using Bacon's simple cipher system, conveys the concealed truth which they had secretly known all their lives one they wished to reveal to posterity in a way befitting two Bacon Shakespeare cryptanalysts, that for whatever reason, while they were alive, they dared not or could not say openly and out loud, Francis Bacon is Shakespeare.